Welcome and thank you for coming out this afternoon. My name is Barbara Lounsbury. I'm president of the Ruth Suko Memorial Association, uh, which we would love to have you join. Uh, a wonderful Cedar Falls and Iowa writer. Well, this afternoon is a joint gift from historian Ken Lechtog and from the Suco Association. And it is the concluding program, if you can believe it, of the year-long Cedar Falls Authors Festival. And because of that, we're going to have a drawing at the end of, of, for Gary Kelly original artwork that he made for the festival. So hang around after the questions, and there will be a reception afterwards uh, and book signing. But we'll have a drawing for, there are only a few posters left, so maybe you will get one. Or you can buy one uh, for $25. So uh, stick around for that. Well, appropriately, the Authors Festival ends with Bruce Succo, who is one of the six nationally known best-selling Cedar Falls writers we have been celebrating all year. Last June, a year ago, in this very room, a large crowd gathered and discussed Ruth Succo's novella titled A Part of the Institution, which is set in a college town before, during, and after World War I. Well, today we bookend that with Ken Lightalk stepping back and giving us the larger picture of Ruth Succo and her era. Ken joined the University of Northern Iowa history faculty in 2001, and he just recently retired. He is on the board of directors of Humanities Iowa, the State Council of the National Endowment for the Humanities, and before joining the board, he was a popular speaker around the state as part of the Humanities Iowa Speakers Bureau. But most of all, Ken is a writer and the foremost expert on Iowa in the Civil War. His books include Left for Dixie, The Civil War Diary, of John Rapp, published in 2004, From Blue Mills to Columbia, Cedar Falls in the Civil War, which came out in 2007, and Iowa's Forgotten General, Matthew Mark Trumbull and the Civil War, which came out in 2009. Just this year, the first volume of his trilogy, Iowa and the Civil War came out, and we can look forward to two more volumes soon. The first volume is subtitled Free Child of the Missouri Compromise, 1850 to 1862. So you know a lot of drama is yet to come in volumes two. You can buy copies of his signing books uh, during the reception after the program. Ken also co-authored a book on the famous Sullivan Brothers of World War II, titled The Sullivan Family of Waterloo. Bruce Succo, as many of you know, is Iowa's Willa Cather. She published 43 short stories and nine novels during her life, most of them set in Iowa. In the 1920s, H.L. Mencken called her, quote, unquestionably the most remarkable woman writing short stories in the Republic. Ken is now going to give us the richer context in his talk, which he has titled, Going to the Woods, Ruth Succo and the Early 20th Century Midwest. Well, thank you very, very much. I mean, could a guy have a better honor? I got to open the festival, I get to close it. And one of the most enjoyable parts being that I am a scholar of the Civil War. It's my major emphasis, my major field of writing. It's often said as a pejorative, though I don't buy it, that a historian is merely a novelist in disguise. I don't think it's an insult, because history is a story. Magnificent characters, wonderful themes. And as my wife has heard for so many years, she got Karen Agee here, Linda's here, they are spinners and weavers, members of the Spinners and Weavers Guild. 
And good literature, it's just so fun to be part of the Ruth Sucho Society, to be able to discuss good writing, themes, characters, woven together, these different strands, these different threads, woven together into a whole. Well, that's what the writer tries to do. No different than Linda on her moon, this sort of thing. And when I agreed to do the, Dr. Lonsberry gave me the title or the subject, you know, the early 20th century, oh, what the heck am I gonna say about this? Well, I had a year to prepare. <laughs> Sometimes, I mean, depending on the subject matter, if I got a hundred miles to go to a lecture, I often pretty much create it while I'm driving. <laughs> but, I have no idea how I'm going to prepare for this, because everybody in the Ruth Sucho Society is more knowledgeable about the length and breadth of her work. But I found myself on the sofa in a blizzardy day, last January, reading an old copy of the American Heritage. And in that was this delightful essay titled, let me get my page number here because I just lost it. Prairie Woods and Wildflowers. Now, Wusuko never saw this essay in print. She died in 1960 when they were going through her materials they found this delicious little essay. And it was published in American Heritage in 1965. So I read it, and yeah, this is pure Ruth Succo stuff. And I'm not building the lecture here on this essay, but it's the inspiration. So I'd like to read the opening lines from this essay. And just contact Sherry Jargon. Uh, she can make sure that you can plug in online or give you a physical copy of this. She went out and found the old uh, American heritage. So Luzuko says this. To most people, prairie country is farm country. Big fields of corn and oats, rolling pastures, with lone trees standing on the slopes. But when the virgin timber that originally covered the river valleys was slaughtered to make room for corn and cattle, homesteads and town sites, good bits of it were left down along the creeks and river bottoms, under the crests of low hills. These are the prairie woods where farmers turned loose their cattle, where country communities held Sunday school picnics and Fourth of July celebrations. Every town had its woods close by, somebody's grove, or down by the creek. Going to the woods was an institution with which prairie children grew up. And that got me thinking that, considering my age and stuff, how fortunate I was that I saw pretty much the last gasp of this. Little town, Grandy, Minnesota, northern Minnesota, six grades in one room, in one room school, one teacher teaching all of us, and our playground was the woods behind the school. Or as I was writing, I think I read volume two of this monster, uh, the notorious tally war in Iowa during the Civil War. And it was something that took place in several of these community groves. Now we have official parks and stuff. There's always somebody's farm that had a grove where people on hot summer days would gather unofficially, things like this. Part of every community. So that got me thinking, well, what about this theme? I'm looking at this, I've seen this in every Ruth Succo book or short story I've ever read. How can I play on this for this talk? So, as I'm looking at it, I decided that this theme of nature, and maybe more poignant today than ever before, as we're seeing with global warming and whatever, that nature is under attack, the nature that we love, that has been good to us. We're now entering a whole new field. 
we're getting further and further away from the nature that Ruth Suko was talking about. So like anything else, you always have to kind of define your terms. We're talking about nature, this question of nature. What is meant? Well, in American history, it comes to us in two ways. One, American history is the story of the triumph over nature. You read the old settlements, you know, the Mayflower Pilgrims especially, and they see that forest primeval. It's frightening. There are savages in there, there are demons in there, and ultimately to tame that nature. This is the triumph of America over nature. And that's a big theme in America. But then add to that, like everything, there's a yin, there's a yang, there's two sides of a coin. There is also the theme of the loss of nature. Humanity expelled from the Garden of Eden, or they destroyed the garden. Well, when we're looking at American history, one of the things always, there's just no way away from it, is the story of nature. For example, one of the most seminal moments in American history comes in 1893, University of Wisconsin, Professor Frederick Jackson Turner's famous frontier thesis, where he took the position, radical at the time, that if you want to examine the American character, traditionally it was described as essentially transplanted European. European values, European institutions transplanted to the new contact, continent. Turner said no. What makes America different, what makes Americans different, is this constantly receding frontier. Nature is subdued, a triumph over nature. In the process, the people are changed. Their contact with nature makes them different. This becomes revolutionary. And you really can't find American history taught without addressing that. The importance of the frontier. Well, with Musuko, we're looking at the Midwestern frontier. This taming of nature comes in different places, different times, takes longer, takes shorter in different places. But when we look at the first real age of the frontier, the Midwestern pioneers, Willa Cather, if you read her by Antonia, amongst many others, it's the story of the settlement of the prairie from the sod house to the home. When I'm given lectures on that book. So here's a thing to watch. Watch the hollyhocks. Wherever these settlers established their homes, they planted hollyhocks. So they become part of the landscape. They're changing nature. Hamlin Garland, boy life on the prairie. Here we see the destruction of the tall grass prairie. We'll never see that again. Little lot bits and pieces of it are here and there, as we were just hearing this morning. But from when you know there's this moment when young Hamlin Garland stands on top of the covered wagon wheel, we just and the prairie grass is as high as that wheel, and he's looking as far as you can see, this rolling sea of tall prairie. By the time the book is over, these are farmlands, these are communities. Or when you centers, Herbert Quick, Vandermark's Folly. Here we see, it's hard for us to remember that Iowa is more changed than just about any other state. It's hard to think of Iowa as kind of this big sponge for rivers and their tributaries. When young Vandermark comes out to Iowa to supposedly this wonderful farmland near Holland, Iowa, what does he find? It's a huge swamp. <laughs> we see the destruction, the taming of Iowa swamplands. Or best reader Aldrich's Song of Years. 
from settlement, pioneer settlement, to Cedar Falls as a thriving community. What we see is a nature, this is the story of triumph over nature. So when we get to Ruth Zuko, a couple of generations later, when she's talking about nature, as in this essay and in many of her works, she is talking about a nature that she knew that is essentially a tamed nature, the community growth. You'll probably never see anything like that. Your know, hot day in the church. People will leave the church, go sit under the cool shade of the trees, the grove right across the road, and the minister will deliver his sermon there. Weddings take place, and children play there. Children play there comfortable, safe in the woods. That was the woods that I knew growing up in northern Minnesota. Every family farm had something like this. And, it, and really, it was uh, these uh, farm woods were kept clean because that's where they sent the cattle. When I was about, let's say, I got thrown out when I was, you know, man threw me out when I was about 13. <laughs> and I lived on a little farm in Minnesota, on a dairy farm, and my job was to herd the cattle, take them from the woods to the milking stations. They knew the way I just had to follow them, you know, in the morning. And those woods were pristine. You could walk any place because the cattle kept them clean. So the woods that Ruth Suko was talking about, the writing about, is a woods that's been domesticated, be comfortable. Now, there's also that in her age, she's always giving hints of that next step. The loss of this nature, the loss of the garden, the garden of Eden, that's as old a theme as you're ever going to find. As generations will now leave the farm, go to the cities, go to the town. Now, they said, okay, get that down. So I decided, let's examine this theme by looking at how it is used in the most famous work. The folks. One of the reasons I chose that is that we were just, you know, the Ruth Super Society was just talking about this book. So many people here have, have read it or are familiar with it. And it's just such a darn good read. And you just see those things coming through it. Now, this is a story that's set in the 1920s. Like this image of the family farm, kind of a little slice of time, the 1920s. After World War I, the country will never be the same. Any American history course will explain that World War I kind of propels the United States onto the world stage. But here we're also before the Great Depression really takes root. And to many people, you know, these are the golden years of America. This is the Calvin Coolidge prosperity. Ronald Reagan in the White House, he, whose picture did he have on the wall? Calvin Coolidge. Very short period of time for all of this stuff. Nature is changing. The small town is changing. The world is changing. The world that they know, the world of nature. So when I look at it, this, I ask the question, is there an age where humanity is at home in nature. An age where nature is a place of comfort and stability. Also, when you read a Ruth Succo book, there's always the question, I do and I always find it, is there anybody that's happy <laughs> in their place in life? Is there ever someone who says, we discussed this when we're doing, uh, you know, part of the institution. They say, this is what I signed up for. This is what I wanted in life. And by golly, I have achieved it. I can take pride. I can relax. You don't see a lot of that in Lusuko books. But in the folks, we do have one example of this. And this is Grandfather Ferguson. He's the last generation to have a living connection 
with their pioneer heritage. And during those years, you know, from the breaking of the prairie to his death, they saw communities arise, traditions are established, churches, community centers, everything that makes up what we call stability, the ability to find yourself as part of a larger continuing whatever. This is what Grandfather Ferguson knew. He does not consider himself to be a tragic character. He is the one who gives the last of the advice of the old generation. He's talking to young Carl, and he says this. He's giving advice. You know, what is a successful life? What are the rules for a successful life? He says, well, my boy, wherever you go, let me tell you what you'll find is the best thing. I'm old and I know it. That's to have a good home and a good wife. Now, Linda and I just hit 39 years of marriage. <laughs> Grandfather Ferguson was right. <laughs> That's the thing that matters. Your grandma and me have lived together here for 55 years. We had our troubles in those times. I don't say we didn't. Many a time grandpa himself must have suffered from that sharp tongue of grandma's. But Grandfather Ferguson said, but they don't see much account when you look back upon them. I've done well with my farming. I've done better than most. I can't complain in that way. No, I'm not complaining but we want a partner in our joys and sorrows. Take yourself a good wife, and don't drink or smoke or gamble your money at cards, and work hard at whatever your work is, and then you'll get along, my boy. These are the principles I've always stuck to, and uphold the Lord in his holy works. He's so looking at his life, this has been a good life. He has no real regrets. He's not one of those who's going to pass on with a mountain of what I should have done, could have done, or shouldn't have done. He signed up to be a farmer. He signed up to be a part of a community. He signed up to be a husband, a father, a grandfather. And as he's looking at it, the tragedy of losing his beloved wife, his place in the world is now gone. The world's going on. But I did it. I could take pride in that. I, I just love Grandfather Ferguson. Well, we moved to his son, Fred Ferguson. Now, he's the first to move from the farm into town, where he becomes a very, I mean, he's really, he takes the farm values, still gets up way too early, and brings them into town. He's a responsible man. He will always be a farm boy who has moved into town. To him, this is the heritage that he treasures. And one of the symbols that I really liked here was a good Iowa hat. <laughs> what on earth are we talking about here? Well, he opens this idea up when he said, he's now the head of the family. Birds were chirping all around. There were still a few things left in the garden. Dew drenched the late summer flowers. He saw some things here and there that needed doing. Carl ought to mow that lawn again tonight. But on the whole, he had never seen the place looking better than it did this fall. There was still a little time before he'd have to think about stocking up for winter. He might pick, up, pick some of the best apples for Mama to use when she got time. He didn't like to see anything good going to waste. Even if apples were almost a drug on the market, there would be somebody who would be able to make use of the overflow. Years you know, later, when he's off in California, he would look at the California gardens and farming, he would stroll around the highly developed landscape of Henry's grounds, asking the gardener the names of strange plants 
and watching him run the water for intricate systems of irrigation. It was clever. But when he thought of finding a place out here for themselves and putting all of this care into keeping the lawn green and queer plants flourishing, it seemed to him a puttering sort of life. <laughs> Nature here didn't seem to do anything. It was all like hothouse gardening. And he might enjoy the green roses and geraniums and lilies, but he couldn't interest himself in these things. That seemed mostly for a show. Of course, it was pretty fine to go right out into your own yard and pick an orange off the tree. It still seemed marvelous to him to pick oranges. Well, to pick an apple was natural and commonplace. Not that he liked oranges better. No, there was nothing that could come up to a good apple. <laughs> this is the nature that he knew. This is what he grew up with as a boy, even though he is a banker in town. Always going back to that family farm. For his wife, Annie, the wife of a bank clerk, now she's in a very awkward <laughs> position. And whether you're in a big city, you know, the blue book special people, or a small town, there is a rigid hierarchy, there are rigid traditions, and the wife of a bank clerk is in a respected position, but she is not in the top echelons. She wants to take her place in town society. Her mother-in-law, they never got along, doesn't like that at all. She puts it this way, speaking of her son and his wife. They're getting to do just like all the rest of them in town. She doesn't care for this. Now, when they go to California, their children are grown, they're supposedly on a vacation, but everyone knows that they are readjusting their lives, possibly to stay there. They find a community of expatriate Iowans, and everybody is anxious to say, yeah, you're going to stay. Everybody stays. Forget about those cold winters. Forget about all of those hardships of Iowa. Stay here. Pick the oranges. And she is tempted by this California retirement. But when she is looking at the land of California, much the same as her husband. It makes her feel homesick for Iowa, for her small town wife. She puts it this way, with Suko. Walking around a California garden. But the garden, all the place, was unreal too. The blooming things were strange in the sea. It's fog. The colors of the flowers were dim. She felt an alien sadness in the tall eucalyptus trees with their dark blots of foliage against the gray sky. Again, the land seemed old. And this moment was like an interlude. She could not find in its meaning in stealthy fog. For the first time, she had a faint, painful thrill of homesickness. Even though she has many reasons to want to be away from the small town, the farm heritage that she knew, ultimately this is part of her. Now she's feeling homesick. They have children. Now, one of the things about this book, it gets one of the great issues of all time for parents. How much are parents responsible for the children that they have raised? <laughs> Can they be blamed for their failures and sins? Can they take credit for their children's successes and triumphs? And in this case, this is what they find is these, the world that they try to prepare their, for their children, bequeath their children, their children don't want. They're the next generation away from the farm. And each, and one of the delicious parts about this book is how, we get back to that idea of weaving, she weaves the stories of these generations together 
with this masterful fluidity. She could introduce something with two lines that 30 pages later is brought to fruition. Carl, Carl Ferguson, the eldest child, the pride of his parents, he is the pride of the town. He's the one that Grandfather Ferguson was giving this great advice to. He follows the rules. Everybody's proud of him. Yet, he does not have a happy life. He marries the woman that essentially the town gives to him. She's the ideal wife for him as the ideal child of this town. But they do not have a happy marriage. He goes on, and he's a perfect example of what I was talking about. He creates for himself a respectable position. He becomes a principal, superintendent in the school system, not in his hometown, but in two other towns. This is a position of pride, honor, and responsibility, and he is miserable. All he can think of is the life he never had, which often came down to the women he never had. <laughs> and when he gets in a reflective mood, where does he go? He goes off to that family farm, the farm of his grandfather, back to the woods. This is where he can comfortably reflect on his life. He puts it this way. There was a grove at the side of the road and a gate a little open. He left the car tilted half in the ditch and squeezed in through the fence and went along the scarcely marked old wagon road. Then he came to an opening, some old picnic place with a few paper plates scattered through the long shiny grass. He ate all through with that half-sweet, piercing want of life. The summer day throbbed with a rich, hot sensuality. Carl lay down on the grass. The sun burned his upturned face. He couldn't go to Gladys. That was impossible. He hadn't the courage. And anyway, she was too rusty, too innocent. It was only what she brought before him. He felt the living richness all around him, the dampness of the deep soil packed with the earthy life of worms and bugs, the smell of the grass, the heavy leaf trees, the birds and teeny hum of insects in the hot air. This is where he retreats. He's, even though he's the third generation, he's really never far from this. Dorothy. She's the ideal child. Everybody loved Dorothy. Her older sister's jealous. Everybody seems to like her more. She's the pretty one. And she makes what is to be the great marriage. The celebration of the town is that marriage. Well, Musuko addresses that with her usual brilliance. Now she goes back to this idea of the small town, the family life. It was still full daylight. Everything was flooded with light. The familiar lawn, the cream colored house standing there were transfigured. It seemed as if the whole earth at this most beautiful time of the year was in bloom for the wedding. And by this symbol, the dark alien dream of the war had finally lifted from this small inland place among the great cornfield. For this hour, their world had gone back to its old innocence, and everything was prosperous and fresh in the sunlight again. The two young people in the shiny car with their journey ahead of them, their marvelously fortunate prospect of settling wherever they chose, had come into the free inheritance of all the years that had gone before them. You know, she is the ideal daughter is because she has this heritage, this inheritance. 
What happens to her and her husband is its own story. One thing about a book like the folks, you could do a dozen of these talks and never get the same thing twice. And then there's the daughter that no one understood, the rebellious daughter, Margaret. This established life in Almond, Iowa, with its rules, regulations, and you, and you can see this anytime someone talks of a small town. There are those who have, oh, I wish I could move back to that small town and live there the rest of my life. To the others, I never want to live in such an environment again. There's nothing there that has any attraction to her. She doesn't feel at home there. So, Rusuko puts that this way. Okay. That uh, anyway. Quote right here. I was looking at the wrong page. She wanted to get away from these places that kept the sense of failure alive in her, that made her as she had always been. And yet she wasn't. The country itself was shattered over with the feeling that she could find no acceptance in it. It belonged to the folks and the folks' ideas. The great rolling country where the rough stubble was getting brown in the fields and autumn was drying the rich pastures. She had always felt more at home in the landscapes in books than anywhere here. In the picture of some old palace garden in the bound magazine copies in the library. In the fairy tale house with the green door that stood in the midst of the forest. She doesn't have this nostalgia. She goes off to New York. She wants to be a rebel. She joins that New York bohemian set with its radical politics, its artists, its poets. And if there's anyone here who truly exemplifies what I was talking about before, that aren't you ever happy? Aren't you ever going to say that this is what I wanted? This is what I signed up for? She's told that by her New York friends. This is what you sought. This is what you wanted. You are now an accepted part of that community. In fact, she's kind of the linchpin when she moves away from her radical New York uh, counterparts. They kind of drift apart, but she isn't happy. This is, she's unsatisfied there. Where does she feel at home? She's on a trip west with her married boyfriend. A rebellious thing in itself breaks her mother's heart. But where does she find what she likes? It is in the west. Remember I was saying this taming of the frontier, different places, different times, out there in the Pueblos of the West, here is where she's, this is my, where I want to live, this is where I feel at home. This is the land that's good for me. She loved all the West. I love it here, she said. Now she had found her own country. Margaret felt that all over again when they took the car that had been newly washed in grease and drove out along the desert road. She remembered how it had been coming through the Middle West, where the very sidewalk seemed to hold reminders of her lonely, dissatisfied girlfriend, girlhood. And she felt every minute that the big front windows of familiar looking frame houses in all the little towns were glaring at her with the same old humdrum, settled family disapproval. She was sure everyone at home would feel if they knew about this journey and they would stop her if they could. But at the first sight of mountains, lying blue beyond the plains, she had felt that she was out of the house's reach. It was the West 
where everything was different, a land of outlaws and bright colors and bad women and high stepping horses. The soil yielded gold and silver and turquoise instead of just everlasting crops. But it was hard and unmanageable and magnificent. Her country, not fertile soil that the folks called the good land, moist and obedient to the plow, settling down tamely and patiently to the tasks as they were printed on her memory with their rural local look, were the marks of wagon wheels and horseshoes and of the aimless runnings and scurries of chickens pattered the soft warm dust under the fringe of willow trees. It pleased Margaret to think that Grandpa Ferguson would have said this land was good for nothing because it couldn't be harnessed to the plow. He calls it old poem. You are useless, O oh grave. Ah, beautiful. How she hated useful things from her childhood. <laughs> it is Margaret, you know, she's the rebel. What is she rebelling against? That very security that her parents, grandparents, that pioneer heritage had bequeathed her. <clears throat> Which brings us there. To Bunny. I was going to name their kid Bunny. <laughs> but they did. The youngest child. He was the unexpected one. And in many respects, they ended up loving him more. And he had the best that the parents had to offer. The best that small town Iowa had to offer. But when he grows up, what does he do? He marries a real radical. Charlotte. She initially gives her name as Charlotte Corday. Now, for those who are in these classes, Charlotte Corday is the woman who stabbed Marat in the back. You can tell you know, the ropes being um, radical of the French Revolution. She's often considered the most deadly of women in history. Charlotte is not a married born. She is from peasant Russia. And she brings her Russian class war with her. Now remember what we're talking about here in the 1920s. The Russian Revolution has happened. And to the radicals of the rest of the world, now the great dream of the workers' paradise is going to take place. We're going to cast off the bourgeoisie and its all, all its values and create something new. And she hates the bourgeoisie. She sees the Fergusons not as minor, middle-class people. She sees them as owners, landlords. She has no respect for them, no respect for the town, no respect for these traditions. Her dream, she wants to go back to Russia and be a part of the communist collective, a communist collective farm, to learn farming, to take it there, to put it in the service of communism, and ultimately Joe Stalin. And that's put this way. Here, Bunny is looking at Charlotte. It's right here, you know, the way Charlotte loved things all in together. The folks were owners in her vernacular, and that was enough. He didn't suppose she knew the difference between a nobleman's estate and this middle-sized Middle Western farm. The things she knew were the craziest mixture of the bitterly realistic and the utterly romantic that he had ever come across. And that's a pretty good description of a communist in the 1920s. <laughs> but he takes her to the farm, the family farm that he has so much affection for, like everyone else, takes her to the woods, to the grove of his youth, and shows her the beauty of a flower. The old sunken tracks of the wagon, of the wagon road, led him into the small stretch of timber that seemed so dense and was so brief. Bun remembered how, when he was a little boy, 
He always used to feel something mysterious in this patch of woods after the openness of the fields and pastures. He felt it now. The trees grew too thick and bushy. Nobody had taken the trouble to thin them out. The season was still so early and the sunshine so scarce in here that some of the trees were barely budded. The old fallen leaves made a mat soggy underneath that covered the cold, black, watery springtime newness and ancientness of the ground. The wagon road had petered out, and he and Charlotte had to go single file along the little path, but well remembered, where their feet sank into the leaves and broke the flaking sticks with an Indian sounding stealthy crackle. It was like one of the old games the kids used to play. Bun went ahead and held back the branches for Charlotte, snapping off the dead ones. It pleased and touched him that she followed him with docility. He had the feeling that this place was his, and that in bringing Charlotte here, he was revealing a precious child in secret to her and her alone. He let her wander around, just as she liked now. It was fun, but it was pathetic too to watch her. She made him think of a child catching sight of something beautiful and not knowing what it was. She put both hands against a tree trunk and leaned her forehead against it. She was used to roads. Perhaps the stillness and the trees of this little place, he happened to be able to offer her something that seemed like a refuge. At home in the house, she had looked clumsy and out of place, but here she seemed beautiful. Bun loved her at this moment more than he had dreamed of loving anyone. He called Charlotte. She went over to him and, plung and, and plunges through the mold and the leaves. I've got something for you. She looked up at him, wondering, reaching out to settle the comb in her black hair. Bun drew back and made a little downward motion, with his head toward a clump of leaves at his feet. Charlotte bent down and touched the white blossoms at the leaf shelter. Looking up at him again, what are they? Blood roots. She touched the white petals almost in awe. Bud was going to laugh at her, tease her a little. He thought she didn't care about flowers. She said she didn't care about flowers, but he didn't feel like doing it now as he watched her. He, her touch showed a girl's peculiar love for flowers, different from any man's. Something intimate, personal, akin. It was something he recognized, although he couldn't have explained it. But it was strangely touching to see this feminine revelation in Charlotte. Bun reached down and picked up one of the blood roots. The orange red juice stained his fingers, making him smile to himself. Here, this is your flower. He took hold of Charlotte's hand and put the blood root blossom into it closing her docile fingers around the bleeding stem. The flowers seemed strangely alive in the cold, white purity of its petals. Well, for Charlotte then, you now she'd been used to the discipline of a peasant's life. There was nothing comforting in nature, but now she sees that it is. Shall we go back, he asked finally. Charlotte nodded. She followed him blindly out of the woods. When they were in the car, she still had the flower, and he saw her fold it carefully and softly in her handkerchief. Now, as I said before, ultimately, did I drop everything here? Mr. and Mrs. Ferguson, go off to California. To them, this is not a vacation. They are in that transformative mode of an adult's life, a parent's life. Their children are grown. There's really not much more that they can do for them. Should they, what should they do for themselves? So they go to California, the land of dreams, to escape to California. It kind of becomes a California versus Iowa. And the ultimate question being, because the Iowans that they meet there, or California people who meet them as Iowans, you're going to stay, you all stay. 
is this really an escape from responsibility? If there's anything that marks the Ferguson's life, it is that they have responsibility to their children, to their church, to their community. These are hardworking people. These are the ones, like the people who create the Authors' Festival, <laughs> these are the people that make the community worth living in. Can they walk away from a life of responsibility? And they hear so often, oh, it's lovely here in California. We don't have to put up with those terrible winters. Would moving to California be a betrayal of their Iowa legacy? When they come home, they leave California for the reasons I've already said. This is a hothouse garden. This is an artificial life. When they come home to Iowa, what do they come home to? <clears throat> Here's Fred Ferguson, back in Iowa. He had a feeling of exaltation as they drove along, up and down, gently up and down on the great smooth billows of the rolling country. Talk about the ocean, the land was just as big. The rich earth that spread on every side was rounded by the sweep of the globe. And yet it was all close, familiar. It was home. Always at the end of the road, he could see the tall trees on either side, with one side overhanging. Nothing was waste. All was put to use, made into a compact pattern of farms. And we see this again and again. This is one of the best parts. It was good land. His father hadn't, Grandpa Ferguson, his father hadn't made any mistake about that. It was good land, and they had owned it for a while, worked it, and received its benefits. This belief in the goodness of his native soil lay underneath the tottering structure of business faith, religious faith, everything. Whatever the folks might do with it, the land was there. This was good. If folks treated it right, it would never let them starve for any back in her home. Once here, the familiar objects made their mute appeal. She went into the living room, switching on the central light. She thought with gratitude again of all those women of all those women had, uh, excuse me, she had thought with gratitude again of all that those women had done. The welcome that she had received everywhere had opened her heart again. Now she couldn't believe in her own secret turning away. This was where she lived. The great bouquet of peonies warmly perfumed the silent air. The deadness that had lain over the place was gone. Now on return, all was living again in a shimmering texture of contentment and pain. Her small rebellion smothered, only partly acknowledged, even to herself, was over. Again, she would have to make the best of everything. Now, one of the themes of this book, again, we're in the 1920s, we hear this refrain again, there's a storm coming. The banks are failing, the beginning of the Great Depression. And the other part, we never find out what happens to Bunny and Charlotte. We have a pretty good idea what happens to everybody else. But did they go back to Russia? Did they try to take their part in building the great communist dream? And the question being, did either of them ever survive Stalin? Well, those are stories for another book. But for me, this is just one of a thousand threads that Ruth Succo, like our weavers, our spinners, have brought together to give us a whole. Thank you very much. Yes. Early on, you mentioned something 
that seemed to associate the land with community. In other words, the land represented to them community. But by the end, I, I don't get the sense that the land is a, a metaphor anymore. The land is the land. Now, I say that also as a Wisconsinite with an Iowa father-in-law who when he looks over his land, I don't know that there's, I don't know that I can compare what he thinks about that land, you know? It's not how many generations different. Well, I'll ask it this way. I, I adopted my beloved daughter at 18. She's a lot of adopted daughter. She's just wonderful. And we were traveling. We've done a lot of traveling together. So, unfortunately, you never knew the Iowa that I knew. Right, there were more people living in Iowa in the time of the Civil War now. I mean, we've lost members of Congress. Imagine what I knew growing up. Here were these thriving small towns fed by hundreds and hundreds of family farms. The land prospers, the farmers prosper, the communities prosper. When I was a kid, I could walk down the uh, lane and go to the neighbor and get work on, on a farm, in the barns, and in the hay mouth, stuff like that. We will never see that again. So that's what I mean about the sense of community that the land is the bedrock of both. The land that creates something for the farmers to build something sturdy, stable, out of that comes the communities. And now by the time this book ends, we see the communities beginning to fall apart. It'll take another 800 books and another couple generations <laughs> before we see the factory farm uh, the moves they used to write for the Joint Register, one of the old editors said, I knew things had gone really to hell in Iowa when I drive down uh, a country road and I see the farms and I don't see any chickens running around. It has changed. Well, thank you very much. This has been a pure pleasure. And reception and help yourself to food. We're going to have a drawing now. Uh, one of the last author sister uh, posters, Ken, is going to draw, and uh, then he's going to sign some books, and we just ask you, uh, we are trying to make Ruth Suko as well-known, as, as admired as Willa Cather, um, so if you'd like, we have brochures to join the Suko Association. We meet just once a year with a program. We meet here in the library, so if you're local, we'd love to have you join us, and uh, it's only $15 to be a member. So so please join us or come back next June when we'll be here and uh, uh, we'd like to stay in touch. So thank you for coming. <laughs> Thank you very much. This is very